Well, good morning, we'll get started. Um, my name is Charlie Lucan, and this is a webinar um, sponsored by Calfee Halter and Griswold, which is a law firm that has offices in Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati. And we're honored uh, this morning to have my longtime friend, John Cranley. Um, and the mayor wants to, uh, we've asked the mayor to kind of give us uh, uh, an update on what's going on, but more particularly, we want to talk about the collaborative. And, jo and John, I know from your perspective, you were uh, on the ground in 2001 when the collaborative began to be negotiated. You were at the courthouse uh, along with other council members like Alicia Reese and David Pepper. You had a hand in writing it, negotiating it. Uh, and now here we are, uh, you know, 15 years later, and people hear about the collaborative and they think it's kind of a good thing, but I don't know that everybody knows what it is. So I thought maybe we'd start with just letting you kind of talk about what it is. And, and you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a report sitting on a shelf somewhere. It's <laughs> theoretically a living, breathing document that you've worked with uh, during your whole political life. Uh, thanks, Charlie. And I, I think most people on this call know this, uh, but uh, Mayor Lucan uh, and I are close friends and served together. I was a council member when he was mayor during the time that we did the collaborative agreement. And I've said that our city's renaissance over the last 20 years uh, is there's a lot of factors, but the two biggest factors was the collaborative agreement and the renaissance uh, of 3CDC started a business community of reinvesting in our urban core. And on both fronts, they only happened because of Mayor Lucan. First, because Mayor Lucan invited the Justice Department in to do a review of our police department, which was an extremely controversial decision at the time. He took a lot of grief for it. You think? Uh, and, yeah. And because uh, he, recruited uh, Procter & Gamble to be the first uh, CEO, to be the first chairman of 3CDC, which in, in this town anyway is a big deal. And so um, uh, those, that, those two things set the tone. Um, and I, I'm not 100% sure, but I, my memory is that the request to bring in the Justice Department may have been after the Owensby case and, and before the Timothy Thomas case. Uh, and it was certainly before the lawsuit was filed by the Black United Front. Um, which I think is significant um, that the mayor at the time uh, took the political heat to do that before sort of being pressured into it uh, because he knew that something had to change culturally. Ultimately, the, uh, there was a separate lawsuit filed against the city uh, alleging a pattern and practice of discrimination. And we agreed through an extraordinary uh, decision to mediate that lawsuit rather than litigate the lawsuit. And I will say that, that uh, this is a point in time, a uh, moment in history, that we were being sued um, and there's no doubt that the leadership uh, uh, and many people in the community at the time uh, felt that any uh, attempt to negotiate a settlement to that lawsuit was was being disrespectful to the police. Um, and so the decision to mediate rather than litigate the lawsuit, which we took that vote in, I think, June of 2001. And at that time, the mayor was a member of council. And so Charlie and I, uh, Alicia Reese, Paul Booth, and Manette Cooper uh, voted yes. Uh, and four members of council, I think they were DeWine, Tarbell, uh, Heimlich, uh, and Monzel um, voted no. And in my opinion, uh, that 5-4 vote was by far the most consequential vote uh, in the city's history in the last 30, 40 years. Because that started the process that led a year later uh, to the signing of the collaborative agreement uh, where John Ashcroft, uh, the attorney general, came to City Hall to sign uh, the agreement uh, with us. And by the time it came back to, uh, for final approval, the FOP, endorsed the collaborative uh, agreement. And city council, including Phil Heimlich, who was the most conservative member at the time, uh, endorsed it as well. It was unanimous vote, I believe. Uh, or maybe Heimlich was gone by then. Anyway, regardless, what is it? 
it's three big things. Uh, first, dramatic change in use of force. Um, you know, there used to just be kind of a rigid ladder up. You know, if this happens, you hit him with the baton. If that doesn't work, you know, you shoot him. You know, what I don't know what the what the ladder of of escalation was, but there was a it was a very rigid escalation. And we started moving our use of force policies to a to try to de-escalate, not escalate, as a preference. And when escalation is required, uh, to use try more and more uh, uh, less lethal ways to do so. So over time, that meant the introduction of tasers, uh, for example, much much less use of the baton. Uh, we outlawed uh, rubber bullets. I mean, outlawed meaning we ended the policy of using rubber bullets. Uh, we banned chokeholds. Um, all of these changes came from a process of changing use of force. We also introduced enormous trainings um, from how to deal with someone who's high, uh, how to deal with someone who's mentally ill, how to, how, how to deal with someone who's both. Uh, we also uh, now require implicit bias training for all of our officers. So I put that all in the bucket of change in use of force. The second thing is transparency and accountability, the second bucket, uh, which is cops are a human and occasionally you're gonna have a cop who makes a mistake. Um, and so how do you hold that officer accountable and how does the community have trust in that? Well, historically, the allegation, uh, and you saw this in a lot of the reporting about Chicago's uh, complaints uh, over the last four or five years, uh, which still seems to operate the way we did prior to all this and way and candidly i think most police departments still operate this way is that if a citizen makes a complaint against an officer it's investigated a by the police uh, which doesn't exactly inspire a sense of neutrality um, and the historical practice has been that there has to be a full and complete quote internal review uh, before any information public documents interviews are turned over to some citizen uh, review board. And that is, um, you know, uh, makes it very difficult for someone to have the courage to bring a complaint uh, because it's being investigated first by the police, can take several years, and there are allegations that cops would, you know, brush it under the rug. And well, I'm not saying that's true or false, but that is the widespread perception. And so, in the city of Cincinnati, what we did as part of the collaborative is we created a citizen's complaint authority that was independent of the police, but had access to all public documents. And as a condition of employment, uh, officers have to agree to cooperate and provide interviews to any investigation coming from the citizen complaint authority. And it's not being investigated by a fellow police officer, but by an independent investigator. And most crucially, it has concurrent jurisdiction. Uh, with internal investigations, which is critically important. The only exception to that is if the officer is being accused of a felony by a prosecutor, uh, and that is extremely rare. And candidly, when it has happened, uh, for example, um, uh, over the years, uh, the officer has usually been indicted uh, by the prosecutor for some uh, more egregious act. So, that's how the Citizen Complaint Authority works. In addition, um, we have, uh, under uh, my administration, introduced body cameras uh, for essentially all of our officers. And frankly, that's worth, you know, 10 times uh, a Citizen's Complaint Authority, although a Citizen Complaint Authority is how you then deal with what you see on the body camera. So they, they work hand in glove together. They need each other. So you got to have both. But, you know, imagine if we go back to 2001 and get some of the shootings that caused our, uh, our, our uh, civil uh, uprisings to, and, and, and rioting to uh, be on camera. And so that transparency is, is incredible. Um, and third is, and this took the longest time, um, was changing the culture of policing in Cincinnati from over-policing to sweep, what we used to call sweeps to a much more surgical approach to go after repeat violent offenders. And prior to the coronavirus, and the coronavirus has scrambled our crime numbers very badly, uh, so shootings are way up, arrests are way down. Um, but prior to the coronavirus, we had a reasonable reduction in arrests of 50% uh, 
uh, over a 10 year period, but a 50% roughly reduction in serious crime at that same time. Um, and so the coronavirus I can deal with separately, uh, which has scrambled those numbers. But, but putting the, if you just look backwards 10 years from the beginning of the coronavirus, the results are fewer arrests, but less crime. And so those are the three pillars of the collaborative agreement, and they've served us very, very well. John, I want to mention, um, you know, that negotiation, and I, I'm not, I don't want to get caught up in history, but that yeah. negotiation about the collaborative, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention, you know, that there was, on behalf of some of the people that were uh, complaining about police misconduct, that there was a group of people, Al Gerhard Stein, the lawyer, Damon Lynch, the third, uh, you know, there were a lot of people who were at the table on behalf of the community and they, uh, well, I think we had <coughs> our differences uh, at the table in the federal court. <laughs> uh, you remember them well. Um, you know, I, I think it would be remiss not to acknowledge the fact that this was a, negotiate, a negotiation with community leaders and it leads me to um a thought which is you know now we are many years later and you've continued to work on the collaborative and the police continue to use it as a basis for their training um but you know to many people it doesn't mean a whole lot it's a, it's history and while you've changed it a lot and you've engaged in a collaborative refresh i guess the, the point is or the question is you know, now you got all these people who aren't aware of all that, and uh, you've got Mr. Mr. Floyd's uh, death that everybody in the country is seeing. And um, how do you bring in Cincinnati those people who are new or relatively new to, to this process? How do you bring them into into the tent? Um, is it the is the collaborative still the foundation moving forward? And uh, what else do you need? And you know, you can't just grab the collaborative off the shelf and wave and say, "Here, uh, all our problems are solved." So, um, how, how do you how do you open up that process to to, to newer folks? It's a great question, and, and you're right that um, you know it's kind of yin and yang, and it, it is true that the civil rights activists in our city, including Iris Rowley and Damon Lynch, uh, were necessary parties uh and you know while we of all we've all butted heads many times over the years uh the fact is that it's a yin and a yang and that's how progress happens and uh, i i don't want to be remiss and not give them the credit that they deserve it is also true that today uh the people who are on the streets were literally babies uh when uh the tooth all this other stuff happened so they don't remember it in fact, the video that is uh, on the Enquirer website right now is an interaction between Lieutenant Colonel Paul Newdigate, our assistant chief, and a protester right outside of City Hall from last week. And it's an extraordinary uh, dialogue, which is worth watching um, to see, you know, uh, a big old cop who's just a great guy, uh, who's, you know, uh, oh, you know, not young, and talking to a very young person who's protesting outside of City Hall. And the protester says, uh, my favorite interaction, and I may mischaracterize it, it's not verbatim, but he said, she says, you know, my people have been suffering from, you know, uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, and Paul Newdigate says, I know. Uh, and then he follows up and says, and, and that's why, uh, you know, since 2001, we've made this change and that change and this change. And she gives this look, to him like 2001 and the expression on her face was i was a child in 2001 i i don't remember 2001 uh you're going back to ancient history and the irony was that she had just literally said hundreds of years this has happened to my people um and so she was simultaneously familiar with hundreds of years of our history as a country but probably less familiar with cincinnati's history over the last 20 years that's not her fault. I'm not blaming her. I'm just saying that you're right, that these younger folks don't appreciate or care. Uh, and they're arguing that there are some additional changes that need to happen. Yesterday, I met with uh, about 10 uh, college students and recent graduates who have been leading on many of these protests, not all of them. And I've got a, a series of meetings that are being set up 
I have another set of meetings tomorrow, and then we're trying to get a meeting on Friday, uh, and uh, and listening. Uh, and I was really blown away yesterday by uh, the folks I met with. They were inspiring. Uh, they were smart. Uh, and frankly, they were pragmatic. They were not, uh, I was prepared for, you know, the defund the police uh, stuff, uh, you know, disband the police as they voted to do in Minneapolis, you know, really bad ideas like that. Um, but that's not what they were about at all. Uh, they, they had very reasonable requests. Uh, they had uh, boiled them down to about seven. Um, I'm not sure I would agree to every detail of what they recommended, but um, conceptually, uh, I was fine with all of them. Um, and they involved things like whether or not we should use gas and under what circumstances. Uh, it involved, you know, officers who had been convicted of misbehavior or abuse not being able to be hired somewhere else. I mean, that's something that Governor DeWine talked about last week. That's something that we've been talking with the governor about. And it's complicated because it involves state licensing and labor contracts and all that stuff. But it's a good idea. Um, and they wanted support for this bill that's going through Congress right now. Um, and anyway, they, they were very um, pragmatic. Um, but they also were very insistent that there be additional changes. So... Um, I was impressed. And so my goal is to keep meeting with them, meeting with others, because that group I met with yesterday is not the only group of young people that are leading on the streets right now. Uh, and I'm trying to reach them. And one of the problems that we've had is literally just trying to figure out who they are. Um, and so that's the, the effort that is ongoing. John, the, you, you mentioned at the beginning the, the collaborative followed by 3CDC. And my contention's always been that 3CDC doesn't exist without the collaborative. And the reason for that is if, if you can't put into play, if we can't put into place some process that gives people some trust uh, that the police department and citizens are on the same page going forward, the opportunity to do meaningful economic development in a place like Over the Rhine or any other place is, is going to be very difficult or fail. And, uh, and I think we're seeing that now. I mean, let's, we have to be honest. You and I both worked hard with 3CDC to revitalize over the Rhine. And I think it's been a good thing for the city. It's been a good thing. And a lot of those businesses right now are, are suffering um, pretty badly. So I, I, the, the hand and glove of collaborative development, I mean, I think that's still there for us. That's exactly right. I, I have, we're in total agreement. I've said that those are the two most important things for our Renaissance, but the first, the, the second one can't happen without the first. Um, that, that it was sort of a litmus test. You, you, you know, you could, if you didn't do the collaborative, then an effort to do 3CDC would have failed. It would have failed. And so what I like to say is that the social contract was essentially broken or deeply frayed in 2001, where we had half of our citizens, uh, which are predominantly, uh, I mean, half our citizens are roughly African-American and, um, or you know what I mean, I'm misstating it, but you get the idea. That they had deep, their government, they, they deeply distrusted their police department, which they're paying for and their taxpayers and their customers. And you cannot have an effective, renaissance if half of your population is feeling mistreated. Uh, and so that commitment to change, uh, which is, you know, fits and starts and all that, but that commitment to change was real intentional and, um, and as a result uh, allowed other good things to happen. Yeah, it, it, was, it wasn't just because we wanted to do economic development, but I mean, I think you focused a lot in, in your career, particularly in the last few years, of the inclusiveness of the government in terms of economic contracts and, and disparities. And you've, I know that you've made that kind of a cornerstone of what you've been about the, uh, in city, the city bid process. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce has their, um, their initiatives that have worked very well. Uh, at the same time, uh, there are a lot of people that think uh, that this is at least in large part an economic issue, that these disparities 
but in our own city, which we've worked on, um, are a source of the of the problem. And I wonder if part of our solution or part of our conversation is going to be the economics of the disparities. Yeah, I think so. I, I think that there will be uh, some uh, changes uh, to law enforcement as a result of all of this in Cincinnati. And that's fair. And, you know, we can get better. And we, we, we view the commitment to the collaborative as continuous improvement. And there may be some improvements pointed out to us um, as a result of all this. And certainly around how do we deal with mass curfews and all that um, is fair game. And we've got to think about that. But the, in my opinion, um, because of the history um, and because, you know, for example, you know, people who feel they were mistreated in the last 10 days, you know, do now have the opportunity to go to Citizens Complaint Authority, have it fully investigated independently. Uh, it'll be on city cable, um, you know, et cetera. Uh, so we have the process in place for accountability and, and it, hopefully they'll be given the opportunity to shine and prove that they, they take it seriously. And I think they will. Um, so I believe that it is likely that in our community, the big changes that will come out of the idealism and demand for change over the last 10, 12 days will include um, a larger and larger focus on the economic outcomes that are still disparate in our community and health outcomes. And the coronavirus has laid bare the disparity of health outcomes. And so this whole idea of racism as a public health issue, um, you know, right now is an important symbolism for a lot of people, and, and that's great. Uh, and we've got to put meat on the bones of what that means um, in terms of, of trying to change those outcomes. And, um, and so I think in the arena of public health, and I believe in the arena of procurement and contracting and small business formation, and you're right, you know, we took contracts for the city of African American businesses from 2% to a minimum of 11%. Some years it's been 15, but we started at two. We've made real progress, but there's more progress to be made. We've invested in, you know, Mortar, which is an African American led incubator uh, and a variety of other efforts that were, are ongoing. But I think that's going to become more important going forward. You think, do you think that if you're a corporate leader, uh, what should you be thinking about? I mean, how do you how do you get into this? I mean, you know, we had Cincinnati Cannon. Again, this is not about history, but I wonder if you you have thoughts about whether the corporate community should up their game, and if so, how? The short answer is yes. Uh, there are preliminary discussions happening already. Um, prior to the last 10 days, uh, Jill Meyer, our great leader of our chamber, had already organized the Restart Group to focus on how the economy comes back from the coronavirus, which, oh yeah, I forgot about that, the coronavirus. Um, and so, you know, we've been dealing with multiple crises this year, to put it mildly. And, um, and that already had an acknowledgement in, pre in preliminary discussions that, uh, that there would need to be uh, additional focus on uh, minority and women-owned businesses. And then in the middle of trying to figure out what that would look like, uh, you know, George Floyd happened. Uh, and so I think everyone is acutely aware of that. And I expect that there'll be a variety of efforts. You know, I hate to use the word task force or this or that or whatever, but there will certainly be a number of efforts. What I'm looking particularly on, you know, and, and, and just very preliminary con concepts. This isn't formed uh, clearly, but we clearly are gonna need to do uh, an analysis of law enforcement. Also, I believe we need to do an analysis of what is this whole discussion around race as a public health issue? And, 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 and how, do we, how, do we, how do we combine resources of our health department and, you know, UC Health and, the Children's Hospital and, and others to, to really do a better job on that. And then thirdly, what we already talked about is how do we really make opportunity uh, more likely? I mean, there was an understandable rallying cry around Black Coffee, uh, a black owned coffee shop in, uh, right across the street from City Hall or a block away. That was looted, um, you know, 
and uh, the day after there was a line around the block to get in. Um, and, and so certainly uh, if we want to see a black middle class uh, expand, which is certainly our goal, uh, it's going to involve figuring out, especially in a city which has a much larger population of African Americans than say the region does, that we have an economy that works uh, for all, all parts of our population. I want to make one comment that's just an antidote apropos of nothing, but you, you remember when, when we began the collaborative process, uh, the, one of the, the, in fact, I think probably the, the, the biggest thing that irritated people was that we didn't tell them what was going on within a few days of the investigation. And remember, you remember how the police chief would say, we're investigating it and we'll report in a few days. Well, that sounded like a scam to every everybody who didn't trust the police. The interesting, one of the interesting thing now is that most of it's on cell phone. So it, that is is very different. But I think withholding that information was uh, was really a source of a lot of our difficulty, at least around the 2001 situation. And finally, I would just say, if you want to um, wrap it up for a minute or two, if there's anything else you want to talk about, uh, you got the floor, and we appreciate it. And, and one other thing, uh, thanks to Megan Glenn for helping, and your staff for helping us organize this, but you have the floor to take us home, Your Honor. Well, your last point is 100% correct. Um, especially with body worn cameras and other cell phone video, I think it's critically important to try to get those videos out immediately. And that is our general policy. Um, and I am in discussions with mayors across the country. Um, in fact, I was just appointed to a task force by the US Conference of Mayors to make recommendations over the next couple of weeks. And here, here's what happens, and, and it's understandable. And since most of the people on this call are lawyers, they understand that prosecutors and city managers and uh, police chiefs, if they become convinced uh, that an officer may have, in fact, done something wrong, um, they don't want the video to come out because it could jeopardize the investigation. And they worry that the officer might change his or her testimony to match the video. And their argument to the public and to the civil rights community is trust us. Uh, you'll like the result better if we keep this information from you longer because it'll make sure that we have a better uh, investigation for a potential prosecution. And there is logic in all of that. Um, however, I have concluded uh, because of the experiences you and I have earned <laughs> the hard way that the, 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 the risk to the community, conspiracy theories and distrust outweighs, in my opinion, any risk um, uh, to, the, to the investigation in order for the public to see what happened as soon as possible. And, you know, I think there are fair debates, uh, fair arguments on both sides, but I come down on the side of, of transparency. Since I've been mayor, uh, we have always released videos within 24 hours, unless um, uh, Prosecutor Dieters has issued a subpoena preventing us um, with a court order to prevent us from releasing the videos. And both Chief Isaac and I have a very nice and working relationship with Prosecutor Dieters. And we have this honest disagreement on this point. Um, and we have consistently asked the prosecutor to allow us to put the video out right away and a few times, um, not every time, uh, most of the times he doesn't, but occasionally he has issued a subpoena. So the only time where we haven't done that is when we have a court order uh, preventing us from doing so. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a fair debate, but I think in the end, a transparency is a better way to go. We appreciate your time, John. Um, thanks so much and uh, see you soon. Thanks.